We're just letting everybody into the Zoom room. I'm Griffin O'Shaughnessy, the founder and CEO of Canopy Advisory Group. We're so happy to have you here this morning at our webinar. As most of you know, Canopy is an on-demand talent firm ready to foster growth, accelerate performance, and tackle organizational challenges through our network of top-tier professionals. Part of our vision at Canopy includes connecting our broader community with incredible experts like Josh Greenbaum, our guest this morning. We're so excited to have Josh host this webinar today. He's a fractional CFO, an author, and an outdoor enthusiast. He's actually been traveling around the country, staying in different locations, um, and is currently in Telluride. So you'll have to ask him more about how he works while he travels. Josh started his career at PwC, and in the 15 years since then, he's helped startups, celebrities, and founders raise money, expand their teams, and prepare to exit their businesses. Josh is known for bringing big business sophistication to small businesses, from companies of one to big, rapidly growing teams. Josh is the author of a book as well called Numbers Scare Me and Other Excuses, a business owner's guide to lead like a CFO. His book educates business owners on how to take financial control and lead with confidence and purpose, which is what he'll share with us this morning. We would love for this to be an interactive conversation, so please feel free to ask questions live at any point, or you can throw them in the chat, and Serena and I will also monitor that for you. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Josh. Josh, thank you for being here. We're so honored to have you and so excited to hear your perspective. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate the nice introduction. Uh, good to meet all of you. Um, I I'm so happy to be a part of the Canopy community and and to have you all here today. So thank you for for the time. So I wanted to jump in, you know, before we start to dive into things, to get into you know the proverbial about me. Let's to give a little more context to who I am and what my career has been, what led me to being a business owner and all the things. So what Griffin said, you know, expanding upon that, I, I started at PricewaterhouseCoopers, one of the big four in their audit group. And it, it was an interesting journey to decide to go there. Uh, for me, it was that there was no one business out there out of college that I wanted to work for. And, and working at a large firm, not only gave me that opportunity to work with a variety of businesses, but to see them at different stages and to engage with them in different places. And it was just interesting to see startup life. Uh, I started in, in the San Jose office in Silicon Valley, and I got to see the little tiny startups from Friendster and the beginnings of social media and watching all that and the dramas around startup life to biotechs and raising big money and, and all the responsibility that came from that. And the piece that was always so interesting for me, both prior to starting with the firm and then what led me out of the firm ultimately was I just always loved small business. And what I loved is that opportunity and ability to wrap your arms around the entire organization and which you can do at a C-suite level at a large organization as well, but to cut out all the sort of fat and all of everything and to just really be hands-on with the business owner and the team and to be able to, um, to really quickly shift and pivot and, and, and get into sort of the desire of a business owner or the desire of a small team or small organization and, and to really affect change in a, in a fast way. So that's what really led me 15 years ago to starting my own business. And, and it's been fun. It's been a journey. So just a little bit of kind of what we're looking at here, most specifically the, the core values that I came up with. And I wanted to sort of start there because I think we'll both highlight who I am, where I'm coming from, and a, a lot of what I speak to. And, you know, perhaps that will resonate with you or, or open up some other ideas. So core value number one, living and earning. You know, they're they're in apologize for all the cliches that we all hear all the time, but I really just don't buy into that hustle culture. There's there's a lot of demand that comes with building any business, uh, be it if you're a founder or part of the executive team or any capacity within the team. So there is often a large time commitment, but I think that 
having that go, go overly hustle mentality is not sustainable. That is the obvious path to burnout and all the things that we know. So I talk a lot about living and earning. How do you build a business that fits the life that you want? Um, the second one being, uh, having an ambitious vision, humble presence is to unapologetically, like have a big vision for yourself, you know, have those stretch goals, have that, uh, you know, be it growth, be it team, be it revenue, be it profit, be it impact, all these different ways that you can have vision and, and, uh, impact with your company to really just be clear on what that means and what you want, uh, into the future. And then the business talk translated is probably the biggest parallel to my book that what becomes important to me is that that finances and money and numbers and all these things that tend to freak a lot of people out are it's so important as a financial professional to be able to translate that in a very digestible way for a non-accountant, a non-finance professional, because Again, all of us, if uh, whatever capacity you're within your organization, it is finance that is the sustainability of a business or the death of a business or the growth of a business or the opportunity to exit a business. So though you don't need to be an expert, it is an area to truly understand. So, and then below a handful of the fun, wonderful people I've been able to work with over the years. Um. Okay. To Wait, continue. what's Jack's fun house? So Shaq's Fun House is uh, a party thrown. So I, I got started consulting in the music industry uh, with DJ AM, who might be a name if you're a mu music enthusiast, and Steve Aoki, um, which kind of then got me to music festivals and all these fun things. So Shaq's Fun House is a music festival thrown at Super Bowl every year, along with another one, Gronk Beach with Rob Gronkowski. And turns out everyone needs a little accounting help. So... Uh, <laughs> I got to go to Super Bowl a couple of years, uh, first one in Miami, and lead all the accounting for Shaq's Funhouse. And I'll, I'll tell you a quick wild story out of that is uh, uh, P. Diddy, whatever is Sean Combs, whatever he's going by, uh, insist on being paid in cash. And I got the pleasure of running around to Chase Bank all over Miami to withdraw enough cash to keep in my backpack to pay him out in the back of an Escalade uh, to his right-hand man and probably one of the most nerve-wracking aspects of my CFO career. So, that's uh, but, you know, and, and to that a little bit, like what's interesting is on all levels and all these different business to the biggest, to the smallest, like it, it's just transactions and there's so much commonality between all these businesses. And I think that that's the most important takeaway, be it, celebrity or startup or the most boring business in the world it's all about healthy financials right mm -hmm. having a good business so um yeah so i i won't go too far into this i think this very much ties to um what i was talking about around the core values but i've had the business i rebranded cfo minded a, a few years ago uh as i became more and more clear on the people I wanted to serve, um, again, Griffin's talked a lot about this in the introduction, but I really wanted to take this learning of my career at PricewaterhouseCoopers and translate and bring that to small businesses. I think that small business need that sophistication more than ever and more than anyone. And often it's the, the C-level in general aren't able to, aren't attainable for a lot of small businesses. So I wanted to really focus my firm in a way that made that service made that that expertise available to the to the small businesses that are truly the backbone of every community and whatnot so um and you know and just adding kind of one piece to that is i think that that's a uniqueness that i am able to bring that a lot of other professionals who work in larger firms don't have where not only am I kind of that CFO brain, but I'm also a business owner and I know about marketing and I know about the whole back end of dealing with Google suite and like all these things that other finance professionals don't always have. So, so that's really an angle that I I'd like to highlight throughout today and just in general with my practice. So some of the plan for this morning uh, to talk through 
uh, just your goals, my goals, what does everyone want to learn from this? What do you want to pick up from? You know, everyone comes from a different place. Everyone's financially in a different place. Everybody has a different relationship with money. Everyone has um, a, a different business structure. You might be a sole practitioner today. You might have a small team. You might be part of a larger organization where you support on the management team. So, so just recognizing that everyone's coming from a different different position. And again, I think that there's still commonality between all of this. So even if things that we don't talk about, if those don't specifically resonate with you, just I, I think that there's probably a nice parallel that you can zoom out from and look from that perspective. So we're going to talk about service and product offering, again, mindset and goals and milestones. So those are those are kind of my goals for today. When I think about goals, these are really the three areas that um, that I feel are important to think about. With your organization, what impact do you want to create as a business for the people who you serve, the products that you sell, whatever it may be? As a leader, what freedom do you want to create for yourself? You know, I think what becomes important is in thinking about goals of, do you want to grow your business and sell it? Do you want to find time for yourself and perhaps put an operator in place? Do you want this to be passive income for you? Or do you want to trim down your team and simplify operations? There's a lot, the, the, there's no right answer. And until you get clear at that vision, then you can't put this financial plan together. You can't you can't say like, hey, Josh, go build me a budget. And I'm going to essentially look at what was last year and, and base that on the next year coming. And, but it's, what is that larger goal for you? And what are the profits as this third point to support what your vision is for yourself, for your organization? Um, again, uh, we will get into uh, sort of, relationship with money, um, how how to start looking at some action items and and all these things here that, that we'll touch on today. Um, okay, so business and you. This is my favorite place to start because again, uh, apologize for the redundant bullet point there. Uh, a lot of people and in particular small business owners find their lives and their business so intertwined. And to me, what becomes really important, you know, as a leader, as a business owner, is to truly think about what are your needs as a business owner or on a personal level? What is your break even in life? How much do you want to make beyond break even? How much do you want to save? Where are your goals in that? And I think it's so important to really take that time and pencil out you know, what are these different aspects? I think when people think about budgets, they're thinking about cost cutting, they're thinking about where can I save? And I think that that's complete the, completely the incorrect approach to take. It really needs to be, again, going back to like, what do you want your life to be? How much do you want to go out to dinner? How much do you want to travel? Think about all this stuff and, and just truly get into that because if you're not financially stable as a business leader, then you're not able to support your business. You're not able to support the people in your business. And that's when things go sideways. That's when you start making bad decisions, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll get into that a little bit more. And um, and, and these are really the action items that throughout the, the next little bit that we'll dive into. So um, again, just a little highlight here. So product and prices. I think what a good starting place is, is when you think about your business to think about what are the different things that you're offering to people? What are the products that you're selling? What are the unit economics around that? And let me talk about what that means. If let's take today, today we're talking for 45 minutes an hour. That in itself is not what this all took. This took putting a slide deck together. This took Griffin and Serena and I going back and forth and talking about what today was going to be. It, it went through 15 minutes prior to this of, of making sure audio was good. So all in all, what appears like a one hour service was probably four or five hours of time put into it. 
So when thinking about a service that you provide, you have to just truly think about what is the real cost within that? Because those are the components that drive pricing. It drives ability to uh, serve. How many people can you serve? You know, how many presentations can you, how many consulting gigs, how many, you know, whatever fill in the blank for whatever's applicable to you. So diving into the, what do you offer? What does it take to offer that? If you're in the business of offering discounts, thinking about how much do I give as discounts and what is the repercussion of that? To in, in And it becomes important because often people think about revenue goals and they get excited about revenue goals. And I think the classic example around that is who cares if you have a $10 million business if it costs $11 million to run? And who cares if you, and the danger of scaling that and the danger of having a little practice where maybe you're making the money that you want to make, but as soon as you start to grow, you don't have the bandwidth and in, in the, the resources to support a team and still take care of yourself. So that's where both thinking about the services that you offer, how does that work? How does that work within your team? What can be delegated? How, again, really starting to dissect that stuff is a huge component of putting together this puzzle. And the puzzle to me always becomes that vision, that budgeting, that strategic plan. What are people buying? What are they not buying? Are they buying my CFO services? Do they want bookkeeping services? How much of bookkeeping takes my time versus delegating or vice versa? Where's capacity within that? So these are all sort of the thought process, you know, the CFO service as a parallel to to think about within your own organization. Um, mindset and value. So touching on that everyone has a different relationship with money. Everyone has a different perspective when it comes to starting a business. There is, again, all the cliches of imposter syndrome and, and things like that that come up where it can impact that pricing on your business. It can impact how you're interacting with clients. You may give more of yourself thinking that I'm just a brand new business. Um, one of the things I always like to say is that your business is your baby. And what becomes really important is to think about the business as totally separate from you. You need to be financially healthy as a person and you as the leader need to ensure your business is healthy as an entity. And if you have a desire to make $100,000 and your business makes $100,000 that you are taking everything out of, your business has zero and that's not a healthy business. So Think, so that that just becomes a really uh, important aspect of the sustainability of thinking about the ebbs and flows of business. A lot of things that I that I like to highlight around here is thinking about contracting. How are you engaging with business owners? Do they need to pay up front? Are they paying fifty percent? Are you just invoicing them and waiting for them to pay? All of these become really important factors that drastically impact cash flow. And again, that could be something that you can deal with on an individual basis if you're a sole practitioner, but then the second that you have a team and you have some overhead and it's payroll due and it's all those things and software subscriptions coming out of your bank account or your, on your credit card or whatever it may be, it becomes very important. And, uh, and we'll get into exactly what those metrics are. Side hustles as a mentality, I think, are an interesting thing. I think some people, you know, be it that they have a corporate job and they want to start consulting or helping friends on the side. Maybe you're a marketing person and you want to help build a deck for somebody starting a company, whatever it may be. And you start to think about, I don't know, whatever, toss me 500 bucks. It's all good. No stress. I've got a full-time job. The problem is that that is setting a precedent for you for you in your mind, for you thinking about the time that you're putting in and the dollars that you're getting back. And if that becomes something that you did such a wonderful job, no doubt, and knocked it out of the park and they're going to tell their friend about it. And now the friend wants to come to you. 
and really just establishing that baseline uh, of, again, I, I like to say that a side, like it says, a side hustle is no less than a standalone business. And to really think about, again, those deliverables and what is the value that you're providing and just ensure that that you're a professional and you should bill as such, you should deliver as such. The favors, the, the d- deep discounting, it doesn't do any favors. It really can set yourself up for a lot of future failure if you don't start from a good, healthy place. Um, and that's very much aligned with this value who you are and what you deliver. Um, it's it, it's a very hard thing. You know, I've had to face this decision a lot of working with small small businesses and they're just getting going and and you want to give, you want to help, you want to support. And in fact, when I talk to entrepreneurs, I encourage them to reach out. I like to say that everybody knows an accountant, everybody knows a lawyer. Just start asking them questions. And that's great. And I and I think that that's an important thing to do. And then on the professional side of that equation, it's ensuring that you're finding some strong boundaries around that. Because as a professional, you're giving value. And a lot of people starting businesses, you know, as a service provider to the people who we help, they need help. They need your support and all that. And it's in it's okay to define the the um define the boundaries to put a price tag on certain things to really define where scope and out of scope is i like to say it's you know that difference between being given a car or buying the car yourself and how much you value that car and the thing i think that can be forgotten as a prof- professional service provider as a business owner is again that transaction that 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 thing of money that we've created in our world and for a client a prospective client a customer to buy to pay for what you're offering just truly means that they're more invested in what you're doing and and recognize that recognize that when you are engaging when you're thinking about raising your prices when you're thinking about raising your prices so you can support your team and pay your team well and offer the benefits and all the things that come with being a business owner. So, so again, it, it's coming from this holistic place where what is your vision? What are you providing? What are the services? What is the team around you? So that's a lot around this uh, mindset of, of who you are and what you deliver. And the, the last point around this is, is, uh, what lights you up inside? I, you know, I like to think about this. There's been so much conversation over the past years of, you know, what is your why? And, and I think that it's a really healthy conversation to understand why did you choose this extraordinarily difficult ro- road at times to be a business owner or to be a business leader uh, because of the existential crisis of the whole thing, the challenges within decision-making and hard decision-making. And I think th- your why answers a lot of that. To me, the second question that you should always look at within that is kind of the, what is your superpower and what, what is your, what is the greatness that you can bring to people? So to bring it back to kind of a CFO service, I can bring CFO service and I can also do bookkeeping. Bookkeeping is not my strong suit. There's a component within bookkeeping and quality bookkeeping that answers my why I want good healthy financials for business. But if I just take on bookkeeping within that why, it's kind of a race to the bottom and it's not how I like to spend my time. And it's not a huge value given my professional background and all the people that I work with. So within that, just really think about within the service offering, within being as great as you can at one, two, three, four things, that it is the thing that will align with that long-term vision, align with growth, align with the support of the team that you have around you. And, um, and to know that you don't have to serve everyone, you know, it, it's a, it's, it's a hard thing because I think that we're all in a place that we want to help people and serve people and solve their problems. And, and sometimes the best thing you can do in solving a problem is to refer to somebody else and, find that that 
that uh, cohesiveness within team that could be multiple, you know, external parties or helping build an internal team or whatever it may be, because tying it back within that vision of what your business is, who you are as a leader, how you spend your time. As soon as you start going down that road of diverting from that kind of core offering of what makes you great, that then leads you to being overextended, not being excited about the work that you're doing. That's perpetuating into the referrals that you're getting because it's so-and-so is an amazing, you know, I'll, I'll keep using my terms, is an amazing bookkeeper, got everything dialed in for me. And then I get introduced to somebody else who's looking for bookkeeping. And it's like, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm I'm not trying to go that way. I'm trying to go this way. So when you're, you know, to highlight the essence of the slide and, and what I like to say, build a life and career you've always wanted, be just very clear on who you are, what you're great at, how you want to spend your time, how you want to cultivate your team and who you want to attract of the people around you. And that's what's going to translate into driving in the the revenue that you want, driving in the profit that you need to support that vision that you have. Um, so the path forward, this is kind of getting to that beginning slide of what I said around impact, freedom, and profit. So to me, that path forward is really thinking about taking that, you know, strategic planning perspective of, of, you know, we all like to say work, uh, work on your business, not in your business at times and, and to find space. And, and going back to, you know, what, what Griffin was saying, this has been a unique moment for me. I, I've never done anything like this. I packed up everything. I put furniture in storage and I spent the past two months now driving around the country and staying in different Airbnbs and from big cities to small towns to places I never thought that I would go. And, and it's interesting. And, and to sort of speak to a little bit about why I chose to do that was I'm looking at making a pivot in my business. And I have client demands on me every single day. And what I really wanted is to change the scenery. And I feel really grateful that I've built a business that has allowed me to be remote and can be anywhere, as I'm sure a lot of us are. And what I wanted out of that was to really change up the scenery and find inspiration and, and have that clarity and be driving for six hours and have that emptiness to think about what's important to me and, and who am I interacting with on a daily basis and going back to like what excites me and what is driving me into the ground and, and making my career miserable because I have that opportunity as a business leader to shape and shift and augment and pivot, have direct conversations with clients about this is the new plan for 2024. Let's augment services, et cetera, et cetera. So then, you know, my, my objective for you, my challenge to you is to then reflect on like, what is that freedom that you want? It could be more time with family. It could be time volunteering. It could be, I just don't want to work on Friday. I just want a 30 hour work week. It can be all of that. The impact that you want to create again, thinking about mentorship, volunteering, you know, impact is sort of specifically a loose word to mean whatever you need it to mean or want it to mean. Um, and then ultimately that profit, what profit healthy business will it take to support that vision that you have for yourself, for your organization, et cetera. So, uh, you know, I, I'm sure we all come from that place of knowing smart goals. So, when I, 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 again, said this earlier, but budgeting is to me a two part exercise. You have the part that we all know of kind of making the spreadsheet and what's the goal and where are we going and what do we want to hit with revenue and what is the team that we need to grow and all those things that will lead us to a profit. The other piece of it that I think becomes underappreciated is allowing a budgeting exercise, and again, personal or professional or business oriented, because I've I've talked about it on both sides, is allowing that to just be effectively an agenda to deep dive into your business. What do we do in marketing? What are we doing with a, our marketing agency? What is our spend? What is the result of that spend? How do we need to pivot 
you know, is the algorithm in Google or Facebook not converting? What do we need it to convert at? Oh, that's not working. Should we pivot and do an email marketing campaign instead? Where do we want to drive customers? You know, so great. Maybe it's thinking about softwares. How many extra Adobe subscriptions are floating through the credit card now that we forgot about? What do we need? Do we need that? Do we need to change to this platform instead of that platform? So again, allowing a budgeting exercise to just be a conversation around all points of your business, money coming in, money going out, the people, the team around you. That to me is the greatest aspect of a budgeting exercise. Um, and this, the, the second piece or the last piece that I want to add to budgeting is that I believe that it's best to do a budgeting exercise within a collaborative environment. Often people will say, Josh, go put a budget together. It's like, cool. I'm, I'm not supposed to put your budget together. I'm supposed to but to facilitate the budgeting process. And then if you are the CEO or in whatever leadership position, you shouldn't be doing the whole thing either. You should turn to your marketing team. You should turn to your operations team. What do you guys need? If this is the goal of where we're all trying to go, what do you need? I need you to work on your part of the budget. I need you to drive that because that entail allows you to manage that person to that budget and give them their own stake within in what they're doing. And, and then again, sort of releases you in a leadership position from having to do it all. And, and, you know, we each have our own management styles so that that can play out however it is best for you. But I do think that incorporation of different people and the expertise and contributing to that is valuable because I think within that you find hidden expenses of growth may be hiring a new biz dev executive, but it also may be a travel budget. It also might be a meals budget. It also might be all these things. And that's where you end up getting hidden costs that will just eat away at the bottom line. So um, collaborative, collaborative, collaborative. And then from that, with the capital needs down at the bottom here, it's what am I going to do with this? Do I have the money to take the business where I want to go? Do I need to look at loans? Do I need to think about an SBA loan? Do I want to think about going out and finding an investor? Do I want partners? What do I want out of those partners if I am going to get an investor? So again, it's that vision that backs into a budgeting exercise that backs into the financial path that's going to get you there. And, and that to me is how you can really step back and have this, this large vision for yourself and, and think about uh, where you're going and how you're going to get there. Um, these are kind of just the summation of, I, I think, things that you could think about of taking away from today of, you know, I, I said kind of what to do today, what to do later. And, and the way that I thought about these two buckets is what are sort of easy things that that you can kind of walk away with and and um do without too much kind of financial sophistication so touching back on that personal budget think about like what do you want as your savings plan you know there, there there's we all know about you know having six months of cash do you have that for you do you have that for your business we all went through covid are you ready for dips do you have a plan B of, of what's going to happen with within ebbs and flows of business for, for whatever, excuse me, whatever we're faced with in the future? So are you planning for taxes? You know, a lot of uh, self-employed people get that lovely surprise at the end of the year or quarterly estimates of, oh my God, all that wonderful money that I made and sitting in my account gets to be sent off to the government. So, so again, just thinking about what are all these aspects and and what becomes the most important for me with that personal budget is what is that monthly nut? What does it cost you to live the life that you want to live? What is that number to save for the future, et cetera? Josh, can I just ask on that? I'd love to know, you know feedback from everyone that's here too. What, what are your pain points with finances? What are your challenges? You know, everybody that's here this morning is clearly 
looking for guidance in a certain area. And so I think you've touched on a lot of really good sort of high level topics, but I'd love to know if anyone's willing to share in the chat or willing to unmute, you know, what are you, what is the most sort of, what keeps you up at night about the finance piece? Is it the bookkeeping? Is it the accounting? Is it the taxes? Is it my write-offs? Is it, you know, planning and budgeting? I'm just kind of curious where, because there is a lot of anxiety around this issue. And I'm just curious if anyone's willing to share kind of what those specific issues are. And I think it kind of dives into, you know, where, where to focus the attention to. I'm happy to chime in because I was just in your ear about this, Griffin. Um, yeah, thanks, Lauren. So I am, hi, I'm Lauren. Uh, I am in the process of exploring turning myself from a sole proprietor LLC into an S corp. Um, and have everyone I've asked for a good accountant says, I don't really like my accountant. <laughs> so I'm struggling to find good advice, either from an accountant or a lawyer, or maybe, maybe you're my guy, Josh, um, on how to establish as an S corp, how to figure out what to pay myself, how to like do everything right. So that I'm taking advantage of that tax classification in a way that doesn't cause me any trouble down the line. Right. So one of the, I think, biggest things that comes up with an S-Corp is it's not worth going down that road until you're making a decent amount of money. And I would say a baseline of probably three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. And the reason for that is sort of twofold. One is as an S-Corp. And to clarify, you can be an LLC who files as an S-Corp, or you could be a straight up S-Corp. In both cases, it's the same tax filing. So that versus the LLC, one, you now will be filing two tax returns. So that comes with its own, you know, kind of financial added expense of, of rather than incorporating the business taxes within your personal return, now you're doing uh, S corp return 1120 S and you're doing your 1040. So that's just perhaps an added annoyance, right? Um, that you can decide whether or not you want to go down that route. Um, and then as you're making more, it's really, you, you then have to start to take a salary for yourself, which is either just normal payroll twice a month, whatever it is, it could be doing a payroll at the end of the year. Uh, but you do have to put yourself on payroll. So it's, you know, if you're thinking about the overhead of the business, are you ready to start committing? That could be, you know, it could be a nice thing. For me, it was a nice thing. I went through that and and moving myself onto payroll, switching to an S Corp was nice because I got a paycheck. I diverted some of that paycheck to a brokerage account. I started to like force myself to save in that way. So there were like little benefits in that. And, you know, aside from that, again, like, that that's really like you get a little bit of an additional write off within there, and if it's just you, I don't. Again, if you're making a lot of money, I don't know that it's worth it. I I think if you have partners, that becomes helpful because within an LLC you have a lot of looseness and structure in regards to taking money in or taking money out of the business where, I don't know, you can take out what you need, I can take out what I need. But if you and I are 50-50 partners, and if you took a dollar out of the business, I'm entitled to a dollar as well. So the S-Corp gives you protection around that as you're adding people to the people to the party, so to say. Thanks, Josh. And we've yeah. got a couple others in the chat. And so Matthias, I totally appreciate this question because I feel the same way. Do we really need to keep receipts for every business expense? I don't nightmare, right? And then if yeah. so, what do you use? What are the best apps? How do yeah. you manage that nightmare? So uh generally speaking, I don't. What I what the the we'll say the off the record thing that I like to say is that none of this matters unless you get audited. And so mostly, you know, uh, I think it, in that instance that you were audited, in that instance that you do need to get back to receipts, that most everything has, whatever, you book a flight, you get an email. You can always pull that email back up. You have 
your credit card receipt. You have the transaction that went through your bank. Like it's not an invisible nothing. That's enough. Because that's what yeah, I'm... I think that that's kind of enough because what's the difference between the receipt or the line item on my credit card statement? Completely, completely. Right. And and I think what becomes, you know, this is very much speaking to then I think questions around deductions and like what can I put through the business and things like that. The second piece, which is highlighting that, is you got to run your business from a tax return standpoint that feels like a business. If you're doing a $100,000 business and you ran $50,000 of your rent through there, why would a $100,000 business pay $50,000 of rent? That could be a red flag. That could trigger an audit. Why would you have you know, X meals and entertainment? There's kind of like these unspoken ratios, let's say. Mm-hmm. That's a little unscientific, but it's like, that's just not good business. What's going on now? I want to see where, oh, you went to Mexico. Why did you go to Mexico? You have a little retail shop in Denver. That's not a write-off, right? So um, I think on the other side of, I don't want to say receipts specifically, but accountability is I think then when you have a team and that aspect of you know, kind of what was that meal for? What? And again, I'm speaking sort of less to the receipt and more towards the purpose behind things, but mm-hmm. uh, I don't keep receipts. Okay. Sure. That's super helpful. I love it. Yeah. And then another or two questions that are around budgeting. People are looking for easier tools to budget and plan expense tracking. What do you like to use? Uh, somebody else said they don't have a sophisticated process in place for checking in on the budget. It feels kind of fragmented. Yep. So you talk a little bit about what digital tools and processes you use specifically to budget. Yeah. So um, making budgets, I use Excel. So either that's going to freak people out more or make them feel at ease that there's a normal tool out there. But um, so I think it's important within budgeting that you keep it as simple as possible. And, and you know, to again, to get back to the logic of it is let's just say you want to have 20% growth in revenue in 2024 over 2023. It, to me, what's the the valuable thing within that is how are you going to get there? It does that mean joining more groups? Does it mean finding organizations like Canopy who can help bring you business? Does it mean, you know, fill in the blank? So then to understand sort of the cost structure around that additional revenue, when it comes to monitoring that budget to actual, there's plenty of tools where you can integrate QuickBooks with budgets and all those things. What, you know, I'll, I'll get mildly into the accounting technical weeds, but there's two schools of thoughts in accounting, or not schools of thought, but two processes. One is cash basis accounting and the other is accrual basis accounting. And so let's just say that you got a new client and it's a $120,000 contract. If they pay you $120,000 in January, the question becomes, do you have $120,000 of revenue that month or do you have 10,000 a month throughout the year? And cash basis says you have that all up front and accrual basis says you have 10,000 a year or sorry, 10,000 a month because that's, that's the life of the contract. So you're spreading that revenue over. And the reason that I highlight that is when you're thinking about a budget and if you're starting to look month to month, just because somebody paid you or didn't pay you needs to be taken into consideration with how did I do budget to actual? Because if you didn't collect all your money, it doesn't mean that you have a revenue problem. It means you have a collection problem, but you might still be hitting your revenue goals. But if the cash in the bank is low, it might be because people didn't pay you. And that would then bring you back to contracting. And do I need to make sure I get money up front? So again, I can go down the rabbit hole with these things, but I do think it's important to, to, you know, the the ethos of where I come from, the ethos behind why I wrote my book is that I, I feel it's important to understand the basics of accounting so that when you get a P&L from your bookkeeper, when you're pulling reports out of QuickBooks and you see the little button at the top that says, cash or accrual, it means very different things. So again, there's plenty of tools. 
honestly, depending on the size and sophistication, there, there are different things that can integrate in different ways. But to start at a very basic level and just start with your budget, I think what is helpful to do within that budget is to really, if you're documenting or, you know, writing little notes on the side in the cell on Excel of what were my um, assumptions to get to these numbers, because you're creating this budget up front and then you want to see how you perform and to understand that I thought this was going to happen in, in order for that to happen then you have a baseline of what your decision-making your thought process was on that budget when you're comparing to actuals. That's awesome. That's really helpful. Um, and I think in terms of, you know, budgeting from Excel, is there a starting point you recommend? You know, like it's a lot of people aren't going to be comfortable building their own budget in Excel. Sure. So I'm sure that you can help them with that. But yeah. if there is a site that has like a pretty bare bones, I think that would be helpful to know. Yeah. Uh, and then we've got a question about insurance too. Do you have any thoughts around there? You know, small sort of, a lot of these are more solo businesses. What sure. kind of insurance do you think is necessary to protect the business? And then obviously like certain industries are going to be more high risk. They may need something different, but just high level. Yeah. On that. Then we got one more question after that too. Okay, cool. So there's like the obvious one that if you have people, you need workers comp. Mm -hmm. So that's a must have. I think, you know, whatever aspects of either general liability or professional liability. Um, and I think beyond that, it really becomes industry specific. You know, I've worked with a consulting firm that is in the healthcare space, that their data is HIPAA compliant. And to think about cybersecurity and, and excuse me, all those, those potential risks of having sensitive data. And the way that that is often mitigated. Let's just say you have a Shopify store. Shopify is protecting all this data for you. You're not holding the credit cards. Shopify is holding the credit cards. So again, uh, in that last bullet point of risk analysis, of think about like where are the risks in your business? Um, you know, sometimes EPLI is important, which is employee practice liability insurance of getting sued by employees if they were let go for wrongful termination. And and if you feel like you're at risk for that, um, and again, case by case basis, it's another situation I think where everyone has a different tolerance and opinion of insurance versus uh, saving on the money. So that's my high level thought. Keep it simple okay. to start. Yeah, I think sometimes, it, like to Sam Levine's point, it will be required by certain clients too, certain levels of insurance. So then you're just kind of like, ugh. Correct. I and and to yeah, speak but, to that, I took out an SBA loan for my business. The SBA required that I have general liability insurance, which I have to send them my policy that's been renewed every single year. So yes, there are things that you do. There could be um, contract terms within contracts that people that someone you do business with wants to make sure that you are covered. There could be, you know, going back to music festivals, there's all those things. So yeah, it's all very business related. Mm -hmm. Okay. In terms of the audit, to go back to that, yeah. um, there's a question around when does that become like a reasonable risk? Is it a hundred thousand? But you know, if you're under a hundred thousand dollar business, can you safely assume the IRS is, you know, it's like not material to them or is is that just, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, it's such a, like a case by case basis because I think it becomes... I think the most important thing in that is like file things timely, pay timely. If someone reaches out to you, they're just a human being, communicate with them. Don't be scared, just be nice and helpful. But, um, you know, I don't know. It, you never know what's going to trigger things. And I, I think generally speaking, yes, if you're a small business, you're probably generally off the radar. But you know, we we're also in tough economic times and states need money and local governments need money and the federal government needs money and they get their money from us. And therefore you want to pay timely, stay on their good side, you know, all those things. Thank you. 
I don't want to keep you. I forget if you have more slides, but I know we're running. Oh, I think I think that's that, that's book. it. Oh yeah, yeah. perfect. Yeah. So here's Josh's that's book. book. <laughs> Um, which you can order online. You can get, I got it on Amazon. It's great, uh, to have as a reference and, uh, we're happy to stay and take more questions. I know some people need to run too. So thank you, Josh. Um, I would thank love you. to help connect all of you with Josh. If you could use help with budgeting, if you have more specific questions, if you want a cheerleader, when clients ask for discounts, I <laughs> love, I, like, literally, I think you said that to me this morning. I was like, oh my God, he's actually like telling me what I need to hear this morning, because especially in professional services, I, it is so hard. We get so many asks for discounts, right? It's like, what's it to you? Um, but you're so right to really, truly value what we each do. Um, clients value it more when we value it. And when we don't allow for those deep discounts to continue or to happen in the first place. So thank you for that kind of like pep talk and uh, we'll hang out. So feel free to stay if you want to chat with Josh and you have more questions. If not, we'll send out um, a Zoom link so you can refresh your memory on some of these topics or send it along to friends. And um, thanks for being here this morning. We really appreciate it. Great to see you all. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. Eyes insights.